and we should be good to go. So today is June the 16th. Is it really? No, that was last week. Today's June 22nd. Today is June 22nd, 2020. And this is session 14 of our study of the letter to the Hebrews. Today we're going to be finishing chapter 7. Yes. Today we're going to be finishing chapter 7. So our primary scripture reading tonight is chapter 7, starting at verse 18, reading through verse 28. All right, that is the primary. It is chapter 7, starting at verse 18, reading through verse 28. I'm going to put the screen share up. And, you know, for those of you who are on the phone, I'm going to make sure I move slowly so you don't lose track of where we are, but for those of you who are on the computer, you should be able to momentarily see the screen share with the scripture on it. Yes. All right, now let's put this over here. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7, starting at verse 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the previous command is a no because it was weak and unprofitable for the law perfected nothing. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. None of this happened without an oath for others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So Jesus also became the guarantee of a better covenant. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office, but because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest that we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Verse 27, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 28. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. And that was Hebrews 7, verse 18 to 28. So now this week we're going to do a quick review of last week. We're not going to do a full review of last week, but just the portion on typology so that those of you who weren't here last week can get that because that's going to be important for what we're doing. We're going to talk about typology really quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then this week will be um, a need for a new priesthood. Excuse so, me. What, yes, what, what is that word? T Y P O. Oh, type. Yes, typology, a type. The study of different types. Mm -hmm. T Y P O L O G Y. Yes, because I had psychology, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I was calling for last week. <laughs> well, typology is a classification according to general type. It's usually used, ah, here's Mr. Anderson, all right. So it is a classification that is usually used in archeology, span psychology, or the social sciences. So you were right to use psychology because it's in there. Typology is also the study and interpretation of types and symbols, especially in the Bible. And that's the definition that we are using. So for our purposes, 
we're looking at the various types presented in the Old Testament, and they are the historical type, the legal type, and the prophetic type. Now, what do I mean by that? Historical types are people in the Old Testament, people who are seen frequently to be a type of Christ. And we talked about this. Moses was a type of Christ because he led God's people out of slavery in Egypt and into the rest of the promised land. He is a type of Messiah. The Messiah leads the people out of slavery to sin and into the rest of the new birth, right? So just the same way that Moses led the people physically out of Egypt into the promised land, Jesus leads his people out of slavery to sin into the freedom of God's rest and the new birth. Okay? Adam, who brought sin to all, is contrasted with Paul, who, excuse me, with Jesus, who Paul calls the second Adam. The second Adam brings life to all. Okay? So you also have somebody like David, who is God's anointed yet unrecognized king. Now, remember that Saul was the king, and everybody was looking for Saul because he was the tallest and he was the most handsome, but he was not really the king. David was the king. And so in some way, David is a type of Jesus or type of Christ in that he is the truly anointed one, yet the unrecognized one. Okay? You also have somebody like Esther, because Esther saves God's people even when God seems absent. Then you have Elisha, who is God's prophet, and he raised the dead and fed the hungry, right? So in each of those people, you see attributes of Jesus. In Moses, in David, in Esther, in Elisha, even in Adam, you see types of who Jesus was going to be later. Now that's going to be important as we go forward because what we're going to look at later is how Jesus fulfilled all of the roles in the Old Testament. Okay? Excuse me. Yep. Could you repeat how Adam is considered? Adam is the first man. Oh, okay. And Thank through Adam, everyone has life. True. Mm -hmm. Now, because of Adam's sin, everyone also has death. Yes. yes. Okay? But Adam yes. was the first one, right? Mm -hmm. So now for every type, there's also an anti or other type. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the types and shadows. In other words, the hopes that the Old Testament people had. Um, and some examples of that are, of course, the rock that Moses struck. Even though Moses struck the rock in sin, it brought forth streams of living water or life-giving water, right? You also have the temple in Jerusalem. The temple was where they believed the presence of God resided, right? So you had the Ark of the Covenant, which was inside the temple in the Holy of Holies. And so you had in there the very presence of God. Jesus comes along and he is the true temple. Mm -hmm. Because God is literally walking around the earth in an earthen or human temple or vessel. Mm -hmm. Another type you see is where Moses, after the people are afflicted by God, the Lord tells Moses, make the shape of a snake and put it on a staff and then hold it up. And everyone who sees the snake on the staff will be healed, right? 
Jesus tells Nicodemus that in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. The symbolism is that Jesus on the cross, when he is lifted up on the cross, literally, those of us who see him, those of us who see him as savior, okay, are healed. Our relationship with God is healed. Okay? Then, of course, the most... Yes. Yes, Marilyn. So, so, I have a question. so then, just bring me back. So that thing with the, the, um, the prescription, mm -hmm. so that's where the snake and the thing come on the prescription? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's where that comes from. That is straight out of the Old Testament. Oh, okay. Okay? And then, of course, the, the symbolism that we understand the most clearly is Passover and the Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. I would suggest for those of you who, are, who have never been to a Seder before, if you get the chance to go to a Passover Seder, S-E-D-E-R, if you get the chance at some point in your life to attend a Passover Seder, I would do it. Either a Jewish one or a Christian one, it's fine. Because you get to understand more fully the idea of the Last Supper and what was actually going on during the Last Supper. Because it was a Passover Seder. The Jews had gathered to celebrate the Passover. Okay? And so you get a, a more full understanding. When we, when we were still doing house church, uh, we did that. We opened up well, for, and you guys know this, for 10 years, we had our house open and people would come by every Sunday and we would do just what scripture says, right? Share the word, worship together, share a meal together, encourage one another, pray for one another, all of, all of that, that, that the early church did, that the, you know, the, the pre-modern church did. That's what we did in our home for a decade. And during that time, we also would host a Seder. So that, you know, for Passover, or for Easter, or for Good Friday, people would come by and we would actually do what the, what Jesus and his disciples did as Jews. They had a Seder to celebrate the Passover. And why that's important is because we see in that symbolism where God tells Moses to tell the people to take the blood of a lamb and put it over the doorpost. Mm -hmm. And the angel of death will pass over those houses where the blood is on the lamp post. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist says this as he is walking by, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. It is the blood of the Lamb that causes death to pass us by. Mm -hmm. It is the blood of the Lamb that causes death to pass over us. So even though we may die once, we live twice. Whereas people who are not in Christ, right, live once and die once, and that's it. It's shameful. Okay. Democrats have pointed out Emmy, you're gonna have to mute, baby. Huh? You're gonna have to mute, please. Oh, okay. Or turn the TV off one way, one or the other. Oh, oh, all right, all right. Okay. Okay, okay. okay, so we see types in the old testament. We see both the people and we see the inanimate objects that point us to Christ. Whether it is Moses, Adam, David, Esther, or Elisha, to name a few, or it is the rock that was struck by Moses, which brought forth streams of life-giving water, or it was the snake on the staff that Moses held up, or it was the Passover lamb. In all of those ways, you saw a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So now let's move into this week. We're going to talk a little bit about the priesthood of the believer. The priesthood of the believer. And during our time together, um, and I'm really talking about this from a historical point of view in terms of our now 12 years in ministry, um, we dealt a lot with I see a little bit of the three I can get a four sorry what are you saying Ms. Anderson no I was just saying I'm seeing better this these glasses oh okay 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 <laughs> okay so we have talked a lot over the years about the priesthood of the believer because as a simple church and that's really what the Repairers Fellowship was and is, is a group of people focused on simple church. And what that is, is a striving to apply the truth of servanthood, right? What does it mean to serve? What, it mean, what does it mean to be a part of the body of Christ? What does it mean to be someone who is part of a larger whole with a specific purpose to accomplish, okay? One of the things that I think we fail to do in our modern church context is we fail to equip individual believers with the tools that they need to do what God has called them to do and to give them a sense of purpose. I've encountered a lot of Christians over the years who think that their purpose is to come to church and to pay their tithes and offerings and maybe be an usher, maybe sing on the choir, those kinds of things. But outside of that, what is your purpose? What is what has God placed you in the body to do? What is our purpose? Okay. Mm -hmm. That is that is that's right. That is right. That is that is part of your job is to is to preach the gospel, is to share the gospel message. But in the context of the body, right? When when Peter says we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And the purpose is for us to show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. But he then goes on to say, in times past, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, not God. who had not obtained mercy before but now have obtained mercy. What does it mean to be the people mercy. of God? But now have obtained mercy. Okay. And so part of it is this. Whereas under the old covenant, Israel had prophets, priests, kings, and judges. Right? They had prophets. They killed the prophets. That didn't work. They had priests. The priests would minister, but the priests were also sinful. So that didn't work. They had kings, but most of the kings were wicked. So that didn't work. And they had judges, but a lot of the judges said, do whatever you feel like. And so everybody did what they thought was good in their own eyes. And so that didn't work. So what they needed was a new people under the kingship of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, a people who were not a people, a people who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So they were people of God. And that's who we are. But what does that mean? And one of the things that we're going to be dealing with in the coming months weeks and months, is we're going to be talking more about what the kingdom of God is and what our role in the kingdom of God is. And then we're also going to be talking more about the gospel that Jesus preached. Because a large part of how we understand the gospel is Jesus came, died on the cross for our sins, you must be born again. Okay, well, what happens after that? How do we live this life as citizens of a kingdom that
that is not of this world. How do we okay, how do how do we do that? And that's the question. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be discussing. But tonight we're going to deal with the fact that even though Israel had prophets, priests, kings, and judges, all roles that were constantly changing, they were all separate roles, they were all different roles, they were all important roles, but under the new covenant. We have one person who is all those things. And he is all those things eternally. So his term of service doesn't end. Jesus is the one who is eternally the prophet, eternally the priest, eternally the king, and eternally the judge. And I know people like to say that, you know, God is love and Jesus is love. And Jesus said, don't judge. But he didn't say he wasn't going to judge. And we're going to see that in the scripture tonight. So let's turn. Go ahead. Did somebody have a question? I thought I heard. No, no. no. Okay. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. As the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. Keep going, keep going. Since you're reading it, Mrs. Anderson, keep going. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we all made to drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. Hmm. Keep going. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body. In spite of this, it still belongs to the body. Yeah. And here, air should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. In spite of this, it still belongs to the body. Mm -hmm. If the whole body were an eye, where would we be hearing be? If the whole body were an air, what would the sense of smell be? But no God has placed in each of us, in each one of the parts of one body, just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Now, there are many parts of one body. So that I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, they can say to the feet, I don't need you. But if more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unrepresentable parts have a better presentation. Amen. So you see what he's saying here. Everybody's not yeah. the pastor. Everybody's not the deacon. Everybody's not the usher. Mm -hmm. You understand? Everybody's not on the choir. Everybody, everybody doesn't play the organ. Everybody has a different part to play in the body. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time coveting other people's gifts coveting the things that we see other people doing. But what the scripture is saying here is that we are all purposed for the completion of the body and none of us are insignificant. We are all purposed, no matter what our phase of life is, no matter what our economic stature is, no matter what our ethnicity is, no matter what any of those things are, if you are in Christ, 
you are there Our significantly right for the completion of the body. Yeah. yeah. You and how does each of us, how does each of us recognize the role that we are supposed to play? All each right. All right. That is a good question. When, when God was sending Moses to the people of Israel, and Moses was trying to make excuses about his stutter and, and other things. He said to God, well, what am I going to show to prove to the people who you, who you are who the, and that you're sending me? What God said to him was, what's in your hand? Mm -hmm. That was the answer Moses got. What is in your hand right now? And that's the, that's the answer for us. What is it? And by something being in your hand, that means your skill. Your skill, your gifting, what is your talent? What are those things? If you're, if you're somebody yes. <laughs> that is a compassionate person, that's what's in your hand. Show mm -hmm. compassion to people who need it. If you're somebody who is really good at getting to the heart of things, when, you know, there are some of us who can get right in with laser, laser focus to the core of an issue. That's, that's what's in your hand. Some of us are really good at discerning. Some of us are really good at listening. Some of us are really good at praying. You understand what I mean? Um, yeah, can I make a point? Of course. The point I'd like to make is because it has some um, relevance to my situation right now. Is it the pastor who's supposed to identify the skill set of each parish owner, or is the person in possession of the skill supposed to make his skill known? What role does the different person per, um, perform? Good question. Let me, let me just follow up with that. You see? Let me just follow up with that because um, one, one of them um, recently, one of the members of a church that I attend, she asked me to participate in the senior ministry. Now I have a particular gift in this area. So um, I was able to share with um, the body um, something that was done by another um, Christian regarding the establishment of a senior ministry. So I, I just asked that friend of mine who's a pastor, explained to him that I was approached by the member and what were his thoughts. He said, I have something for you and uh, um, I will give you to it because I did something like this for my body and it was accepted and everything is rolling. So he did pass it on to me and I passed it on to the the church that I attend. And after one year, nobody got back in touch with me at all. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to follow up with it again. And um, I, I, I did not outline my specific skill set because I did not re regard that as relevant. So I had to, at this point, um, elaborate on my particular skill set, why I thought I was suitable for that role. But again, I would be happy to work with anybody. I did not really want a position. I'm prepared to wait on God and let God lead. But not having heard anything, it had to go down this road. Mm -hmm. And um, I do not understand what will really happen up to now, but it did cause a little bit of a conflict. Of course it did. Uh, you know, which I thought was totally unnecessary. Well, here, so, here's what I have found in my experience. Yeah. When we are dealing with church, okay? And by church, I mean the organization that we find ourselves a part of. I don't necessarily mean the body of Christ. I'm talking about 
the, the organizational structure that we find ourselves a part of, okay? Mm -hmm. I wanna make that distinction. Yeah. What I find is that churches are looking to bring people in that will benefit what their overall goals are. Yes. Okay? Yes. Not necessarily what would be best for the body the of Christ. That's right. Okay? Not necessarily what would be best for the body of Christ as a whole, but specifically what will be good for them in the whatever their mission or goal is. And so what happens in those kinds of situations is that there are a lot of people who end up sitting in the pews who could be useful, but because what they are, what they bring to the table doesn't necessarily match. Here's an example. One of the, I will say this, okay? When my mother in my former church, when my mother brought her skill set to the table, okay? My mother is a classically trained singer, okay? My mother's skill set was not immediately accepted in the church that we were going to because they were aiming for a more youthful presentation. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it was only because one of the one of the elders in the church who whose mother is also a classically trained musician and like me grew up straddling both of those things, the, the classical and the traditional, the jazz versus the contemporary, whatever, whatever. He pushed for there to be a choir in the church that would bring that style of music to the forefront. Otherwise it wasn't going to happen because it wasn't what was deemed um, that's necessary okay mm -hmm. and so there were a lot of people and then when those people came and that choir got started and those people were a blessing to the body right yeah if it were for only the senior leadership it never would have happened because mm -hmm. people tend to do things in accordance with what they believe their vision is and remember other people's vision for you will never be as broad as what God's vision for you is. Uh -huh. Yes. Other yeah. people's definition of you will never be as complete as what God's definition of you is. Mm -hmm. So you can't allow other people to define you. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Marilyn. But suppose you don't know your child, you don't know what your, in this case, you don't know what your gift. Uh, All right. I How would say, you? I would say that the Bible says that if you want wisdom, seek God. Yes. Because he is willing to give wisdom to those who seek it. Uh -huh. And so I would say again, what, what did God say to Moses? What's in your hand? What is it that you know that you are adept at. And I would start there. Here, and here's another thing, okay? And, and here's another example. I am not unusual in this, okay? If, I, if we had stayed where we were in the ministry context that we were in before, meaning the church that, that my wife and I were in for 17 years, et cetera, et cetera, we would not be having this conversation today. Because in that context, I was little more than choir director slash vocal arranger. That wasn't the fullness of what God called me to, but it was the position that I was in, in that body as defined by those who were in charge of it. Okay, I'm grateful for that time because I've met some of the most wonderful people in the world during that time. 
I, you understand what I'm saying? But if I had yeah. stayed there, I would have been pigeonholed into a position that wasn't the fullness of what God had for me. Had intended. And so yeah. how you, so, so he is willing and able, and it gives him good pleasure when you seek after him to show you what it is you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I, I, okay, the, there, there are two Marilyns on this call, right? Marilyn Gore Harewood, who was on this call, is a person that God used very tremendously to push me into my purpose as a pastor. Okay? Yeah. And when we were in a situation where literally in 2007, it, it seemed as though we were going to be a small group of people, shepherdless and with no place to go, because the ministry that we had been a part of for the past few years was closing. It was Marilyn who God gave a word to that was for me, that released me to doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, I, yeah. I, that was her, that was one of the things that she was supposed to do in that moment as part of the body, was to be praying and listening to hear what God had to say. <laughs> okay, and came and gave me four words. And I was like, what, are, what do you have to say? She said, the Lord said, he will pastor us, meaning me. And it was confirmation of something that I was toiling with, but to hear it out of somebody else's mouth, somebody who I love and respect, okay? It was, it was in that moment that because she listened, a lot of people got blessed because God gave me the strength and the courage to step out and do what I knew I was supposed to be doing since I was rather small, to be honest. Okay, but that's just an example. We are all parts of this body, and he uses mm -hmm. us to minister yeah. to one another. He uses us yeah. to encourage one another, and if he uses and and if people will not, and especially this group of people, mm -hmm. we are all in positions where people look at the color of the hair that may be on our faces. Okay, and decide that because it's gray, we're less useful than others. All right. Um, I see that. I see that in in my professional life as well. And I'm still in my fifties. Okay, this culture that we are a part of does not understand the idea of wisdom and how the wisdom of the older plus the energy of the younger propels the body forward. Uh -huh. But that's what the Bible says. Yes. That's what scripture understands. Mm -hmm. That we need everybody and everybody's, you know, we've, we have, there's, there's hundreds of years of wisdom on this call right now. Right? And, and so God uses that in his time and in his purpose to help to guide the younger ones that are in the body. The problem is that in, once again, I'm talking about organizational structures, the organizational structure that we call church doesn't seem to understand that. And so older people are not valued as they should be. Younger people are given, in my estimation, too much responsibility for making decisions that they really do not have the wisdom yeah. to make. True. Because, okay, when I was 30, I knew True. everything. All right? When I was 29, 30, I knew everything. At 58, I find I no longer know everything. Okay. Yeah, but that is not something you, that's that is something that you have to come to as you continue to grow. And so my prayer for churches and my prayer for pastors is that they see 
the fullness that God intended and not just what their agenda is, because that's the only way that the body is going to continue to grow the way that Jesus wants it to. Okay. What do you have to say? Okay. Yes, as, as you have said, you see, um, I think it's what, what should happen is that God's will should be sought. Mm -hmm. What is God's will for that particular person in mm -hmm. the body? Mm -hmm. What is God's will? Mm -hmm. And um, if we pray about it, then God, I think, will provide the answer. But we cannot just ignore it as if there's no need when there has not never been a properly established senior ministry. And as I, I've, I've done some audits for, for churches, and it is extremely important that policies and procedures should be set up to protect the most vulnerable people in the church, older, oldest people, and the mm -hmm. youngest people. So we've mm -hmm. got to have proper policies and procedures to protect them. Look at the, look at the Boy Scouts. Look at the abuse that has taken place in the Boy Scout um, right. operation over the years. But and you nobody sat down there and allowed it to happen. And some old people find themselves in the same situation too because they have a little money and people um, yes. abuse that and you know, yes. a lot of people trust. It is. But so remember, need to set up. But you remember, see? you're not going okay. to make. You got to unmute yourself, man. You, you got to unmute. Yeah. Now I can. You, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Can I? May I? Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi. Hi. You know what? Let me just say. Let me say this, okay? When people come into the physical, the physical group of believers, which is the so-called church, okay? They are not given the directive to go to God first. Go to God. Don't try to be nothing in here. Go to God. Learn God. Learn. Jesus said, come, learn of me. I am meek, I am lowly, I am humble. When we come out of the world, we come out of all kind of pride, all kind of competition, all kind of attitude. And we find ourselves in the midst of chaos because then we get into the mill and the mill says to compete. Get to the highest level. If it's the if it's the hospitality, get to the highest level. You want to be the head usher. If it's the if it's the band, get to the highest level. Play the best instrument. Sing the best song. Because all you're doing is climbing. And I said, teach me how to stay on my knees. Teach oh. me how to bend my back before God. Teach me how to eat the bread of life and drink the living water before I ask God to put me out there to do anything. Because I'm gonna tell you something, we're so wound up with what we think the church wants us to do, that we miss what God wants us to do. Hey, yes, I said Amen. for many years, I got accolades, I loved it. I loved being a celebrity, I loved it, I loved it. I can't sing no more. <laughs> I can't sing no more. Mm -hmm. But I minister to everybody I can. Amen. Right here in this house. I minister. I share about where I am and what God has done for me and what God is doing for me right now. Every chance I get, anybody who call me up, these business people, whatever, if I find an opening, the Holy Spirit said, jump in there. Then mm -hmm. I jump. Mm -hmm. But when I was back there, I was in a mill. And I was not happy. And I was confused. 
and I was afraid because I was not being directed to the throne of God. I was running, running from flesh and being directed to flesh. Yeah, me and Cyril used to sit down and the Lord used to the, the Lord used to move mightily. We would be sitting there before the Lord crying like two babies. <laughs> and we laughed later on because we said we used to sit in that car and snot all over the place. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit was convicting us and saying, yes. you don't belong here. <laughs> I didn't call you to be no celebrity. <laughs> so you need to listen and you need to open up your ears and open up your eyes and get on the road and walk and know that I am with you. I will pass to you. I will lead you. I will guide. And anytime Cyril get discouraged, I tell him all the time, I don't care if one person calls in on Monday night. You minister with all your heart because that's what God called you to do. The singing was just, it, it, was, a, it was a gift and he uses it when he wants to use it. But the totality of what you are in the hand of God, remember that old song, little becomes much when you put it in the master's hand. Amen. Amen. And that's why God said to Moses, what do you have in your hand? Mm -hmm. Well, I have in my hand life. I have life. And it's the life that Jesus gave me when I died and he gave me a new birth. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I'm done. <laughs> Amen. And that, that's it, you know. That's yes. It. So oh my goodness. Yeah, you're, right. you Listen, have an opportunity. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy Drew. Go ahead. Well, Corinthians, what we read. We read First Corinthians. First Corinthians 12, and we read oh. from verse 12 to verse 23. Oh, I guess I was looking at the wrong verses. First, First Corinthians 12, 12 to 23. 23. Thank you. You're welcome. If, You're I, welcome. if I might follow up, you see, if I might follow up, the, the point I want to make is this, that it's not something, it's not a position that I was seeking. Right. One of the older members of the church who had been around for a long time, it was she who initiated the contact. Right. And suggested to me, that I should take some time okay. to seek what seek God's will. Okay. And that's all it happened. So do you think it was not some, do you think not something that I was actually God's seeking? Will. Do you think that it was God's will for you to discover that there is an issue in terms of the specific needs that older people have? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that that was part of God's will for that to be revealed to you in terms of a plan to benefit the most vulnerable among us? Because if that's what God wanted you to do, that yeah. doesn't mean that it was specific to that organization. That was for his body. Right. It may not be for that, that four wall building and whatever that one place is. Mm -hmm. That may be for the body. That may be for you to put together as part of your business as some sort of package that you can talk to other churches about who may be more interested in how to help their older and how to help their most vulnerable. You understand? So, so because one building is acting as though they don't understand what did Jesus say? When you go into a town and you give your peace, mm -hmm. if they do not receive it, mm -hmm. shake the dust off of your shoes yes. as a testimony against them and go on to the next town. Yes. Indeed. So yes. what he is giving you 
is Thank you. here to gift the body. Nice. Okay? It's Thank bigger you. than that building. You're welcome. You're welcome. The other piece to that is in all things that you're going to do or you even think to do, seek God's will. Yes. And his timing. Yes. His will and his timing mm -hmm. are your key to being sent to the right place at the right time. Yes. 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 Thank you. Amen. 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 I don't think that we're going to get through all of this tonight, which is a good thing. No, because this, this conversation is wonderful. Very important. Um, I don't think we're going to get through as, all of this tonight. So we're going to get through as much as we can. And then we're going to finish this next week. Okay? Because it's already okay. quarter to nine. It's already right. quarter to nine. But I want to quickly talk thank about... You, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, because this was good. <laughs> this, is, this is a very good thing. Um, so we're going to talk for a minute about Jesus being the prophet and the king. Okay. Okay? Because, okay. again, Jesus embodies all of those Old Testament um, positions, prophet, priest, king, and judge. So I'm going to put the screen share back up. And the passage that I'm going to be reading is the beginning of Hebrews, right? The beginning of Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 1. He's in bed on the screen. Long ago, God spoke to the followers. Excuse me. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets in different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So what is that saying? That Jesus is the prophet for the last days. In time past, God spoke to the fathers. God spoke to his people by the prophets in different times and in different ways. But now, because we are living in the last days, okay, we are living in the days between Jesus' first appearance and his second and last appearance. So these are technically the last days. They've been some long last days, in the last but they are the last days. Does that mean that I'm saying the rapture is coming next week? No. No. Because this was written 2,000 years ago. It was true then. Okay? Mm -hmm. It says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That is saying that Jesus is a prophet, and he is the prophet for the church. So that means that these people who are running around calling themselves prophets and prophetess mm -hmm. are not telling the truth. Yeah. What are we going to do with that another time? It says that God has appointed him, who him, the son, heir of all things, and made the universe through him. So now if the universe was made through him, then he is God. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is not only the prophet, but he That's is right. God. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Whose powerful word? Jesus' powerful Jesus. word. Mm-hmm. So if Jesus' word is the sustaining force of all things, then we should spend a lot more time studying Jesus' words. Word. Mm -hmm. And that is another thing, like I said, we're going to be talking about what is the gospel that Jesus preached. We spend a lot of time in church dealing with the epistles. We talk a lot about Paul. We talk a lot about Peter. We talk a lot about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and their interpretations. We need to be reading what the Bible says Jesus said. Why? Because his word is sustaining all things. Hmm. What it says. Look at it again. Verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact 
expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became higher in rank than the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. That was to explain to the Jews who believe in angels and believe that angels are, you know, these powerful beings. Jesus is more important than the angels. Don't get it twisted. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is God. Jesus is the exact expression of the of the nature of the Father. It is Jesus' wow. word that sustains all things. Okay? Yeah. Revelation chapter 17, 14, Jesus is called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Mm -hmm. Paul calls him the only potentate, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Mm -hmm. So no. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Okay? Mm -hmm. He is said to be potentate, which is a ruler, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So he is he is the king. Yes. Scripture says that he received Lord all, Lord. right. He received all authority, right? Mm -hmm. And after his resurrection from the dead, that's what he says. He says, now all power under heaven, all power, heaven and earth is given unto me. Yes. The scripture also refers to him as Lord, one who must be obeyed. And the difference there is important. Because whereas the king is the overall ruler of everything, a lord is someone who is more... Okay, it's like the difference between the president and your local mayor. Mm -hmm. The president sets policies for the whole country. The mayor is more responsible for setting policies yeah, within the locality, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is both. He is not only setting the global or universal policy, he is also setting the local policy at work in your life. Mm -hmm. That is why he is both king, which means overall, and lord, and lord, which means close and specific to you. You got it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's read First Timothy. Chapter 6. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 3. If anyone teaches other doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing, but has a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. Uh -huh. if, you, if any of you have Netflix, you should watch the documentary called American Gospel. If you have Netflix, you should watch the, the, the documentary called American Gospel. It deals with that very thing. Listen to that verse again. Okay? Starting at verse 3 again. If anyone teaches other doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited understanding nothing, but has a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these 
come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. Verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Verse 9, but those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. Mm -hmm. Verse 10, listen to this verse carefully. For the love of money is a root, root. Is a root of all kinds of evil. What people tell you in church today is that the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. That is not what the scripture says. The love of money is not the root of all evil. You know that because there was no money in the garden and yet Adam sinned. So if the love of money was the root of all evil, Adam would not have been able to sin because there was no money in the garden. What Paul is saying is that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not all evil, but all kinds of different things you can get in trouble for because money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Mm -hmm. See, people try to use this verse to say that God doesn't want you to be rich. If you're a Christian and you're rich, that's fine. As long as your money is not an idol that becomes more important to you than God. You understand? Yes. It, as long as your money, as long as your wealth, whatever wealth God allows you to accumulate is not an idol, then there's no problem. If it becomes an idol and gets between you and God, he will take it from you. Because he loves you enough to make sure that you value him before everything else. All right? Yeah. Because remember, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Mm -hmm. And every branch in me, the Father prunes so that it will bear more fruit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Verse 11. But you, man of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate. I charge you to keep the command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring about this in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light. No one has seen or can see him. To him be honor and eternal might. Amen. Yeah. Okay, we got two minutes. So we're going to talk about this for five minutes and then we're going to end. All right, because I want to I want to just get, get to this. The kingship of Jesus was prophesied in the Bible. The kingship yeah. of Jesus was prophesied in the Bible. There are a number of prophecies. We're only going to deal with two of them tonight, one of them that we, we read fairly often, which is Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast. What's a dominion? The area of the rule of a king. The area of his reign. That's right. So the dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The seal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. What does it say about him? The child will be born. You've heard yeah. Handel's Messiah enough time. For unto us a child is born. Son will be born. Okay. A son will be given to us. Mm -hmm. Not our son. Okay. A son will be given to us. And what does it say? The government will be on and his, his shoulder. shoulder. Which means that the reign of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is a lot more than the cross. The government, the administration of God's kingdom is on Jesus. And he will be called what? Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor. Counselor. Mighty, God. Mighty, God. Mighty God. Eternal or Everlasting Father, Prince of, of Peace. peace. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that came true in Jesus, right? Yeah. Last one. Last one for the night. Daniel 2, 44 to 45. Daniel 2, 44 to 45. In the days of those kings, and he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel is, because Nebuchadnezzar has called Daniel to ask him what his dream meant. He saw the statue that had feet of clay and there was bronze and gold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he brings in Daniel to, to interpret this dream for him. And Daniel shows him that the statue represents different kingdoms. And then listen to what Daniel says. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Hmm. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. Listen to this. You saw a stone break off from the mountain, mountain. without a hand touching it. And it crushed the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God has told the king what will happen in the future. This dream is true and its interpretation is certain. Jesus came from God mm -hmm. without a man's, without the involvement of a man. Mm -hmm. And the kingdom of Jesus will crush every other kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it will have no end. That's the kingdom that you are a subject of. That's the king who you are subject to. Not the US government. Okay? And I'm not saying don't vote, and I'm not saying don't take part in your local elections, and I'm not saying don't be civic minded, and I'm not saying don't participate. But I'm saying to you understand that as Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Mm -hmm. You are not a citizen of an earthly kingdom. You are a citizen of an eternal, heavenly kingdom. Okay? You have mm -hmm. built your house. Another. You have built your house on the rock. And the rock, the scripture calls him the denied stone, that stone that provides a foundation for those who are trusting in him, but it is also damnation because it crushes those who do not. Mm -hmm. That stone the the is the foundation, the foundation of our hope, the foundation of our trust, the foundation of our belief. Build your house on the rock. 
build your house on the rock. Put your mm -hmm. faith in the rock. Yeah. And I'm not talking about prudential. Okay? Yeah. Okay? That rock is Jesus. Yeah, he, yes, yes, he is the one. That yes. rock is Jesus, the only one. Amen. Be very sure. Be That's very right. sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Amen. 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 So we're going to stop here and we're going to finish this, God willing, next week. This has been very productive. I am very lifted. Um, this has very definitely been a, a good time together. I, I'm very, very glad all of you are on and I'm, I'm just very blessed to be doing this with, with wonderful people like all of you. Yeah, we are sorry for um, coming to the meeting late, but the inclement, the inclement weather down here. That's what we heard. Problem. We were praying for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank we you. We were praying for you. That's why the rain stopped. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's why it stopped. Praise right. The Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Who would like to pray and close us out? Because I've talked enough. Who would Who would like to? The floor is open. Whoever would like to. Have, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the discussion and the different factors that were illuminated. Yes. We submit ourselves to you and your direction, your will. Yes, Lord. Let us, with a dose of humility, yes, Lord. try to submit ourselves to your leading and pray and seek your will. Although it might take a long time, wait on you. Great patience yes, on you for the doors to be opened and your yes, will to be manifested in um, not only in our spirit, but the spirit of all those around us. Yes, Lord, we thank you for all that was shared with us by Pastor Jermaine this evening. We pray for all members of this group not only those who participated, but each member of their families, wherever they are. Yes, Lord. You are not limited by space or time. And our prayers go to all members of the family, whether they're in Jamaica or Trinidad or Jamaica or yes, Lord. Timbuktu. Yes, Lord. We know that you're not limited. So we pray for your blessing, your favor, your touch, your presence on each person. And we pray that we will develop a greater understanding of your word and your will. Yes, Bless us all together. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Love you all much. Hi. Okay. Thank God you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless us all. Amen. <laughs> okay, Marilyn. <laughs> okay, Marilyn. <laughs> you are here. All right, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night Jude. Jude. Okay, Good Constance. Night, Jude. Okay, Pastor. All right. I'm gone, everybody. Good night. Okay. All right, Pastor Jonathan, thank you very much. You're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, Constance. Danny, are you okay? Darling. Yes, darling. Thank God bless you all. Hey, that's good. Keep yourself safe. I will, and I'm so glad the storm ended for you to come on. Thank Great you. Job. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.